So, welcome everybody. Yeah, I'm working at Deutsche Telekom in the Connected Home Department, uh, working on a smart home platform called KiwiCon there. And as part of my job, I'm also the project lead of the open source project Eclipse Smart Home. And in my spare time, I'm taking care of another open source project called uh, OpenHub, which is an uh, open source smart home solution. So you see that my life is all around smart home day and night. So I want to, to tell you a little bit from the experiences there. Um, just a question to you. Who of you is uh, doing some kind of home automation already? Okay, just a few. Who, is, uh, who, who wants to start with that? Many more, very good. So the ones who, who already do something, they uh, will find the following probably very familiar. The others, um, it's something that uh, you will definitely come across very quickly. So let's assume uh, we're a beginner. We start with uh, something around the home. So what we, do we usually do? Well, we go to the shop and as a consumer buy some kind of smart device. Take, for example, the NetAtmo weather station where you can track your temperatures in the house and uh, the air quality and uh, have some nice app with that. Nice starting point. You might also buy some smart plug for your Christmas lighting or for whatever you want to um, switch with that and do that. Or you go for a connected speaker like Sonos speaker um, to have your Spotify stream through the house and uh, have that working. But once you bought a few of these devices, uh, you will actually start having ideas how you could make things much uh, more nicer for yourself. So, for example, your weather station, it could say, well, if the air quality is bad, the speaker could actually tell you, hey, better open a window now. Or if the humidity in your room drops uh, below a certain level, then your plug could automatically switch on the humidifier and uh, you don't have to do that yourself. That could be all automated. But once you're at that level, you notice that well, all you bought there are many, many silo applications. All the stuff simply won't work with each other. It only works for its intended use case with its own application. And um, it's really nothing compatible with each other. Now, if you look at the market landscape, there are really so many different protocols, technologies, uh, consortiums, and so on around smart home technology that um, yeah, it's really a huge mess there, and uh, it's very difficult to decide what to buy, what will work somehow with the rest, and what makes sense for you. So, um, I think the, the industry here has created quite a mess over the past years, and wouldn't it be time to more or less come together, say, let's, let's start that in some better way, and this time more intelligently? So can't the industry get together, define the universal standard that all devices in future should implement so that everything is compatible with each other? Well. It's a, it's a nice idea, but uh, the problem about this idea is actually that too many people believe in it and are trying to actually do exactly this thing. And um, the result of that um, is not only this uh, comic strip here, but um, unfortunately this uh, comic is actually the reality, which you can see on the next slide. So. This is uh, the number of alliances and consortiums around IoT in general over the past years. I myself started with home automation in 2007, 2008. At that time, we had the OMA, the Zigbee Alliance, um, Z-Wave, or an ocean was at the horizon. And I thought, oh, what a mess already. I need something to integrate that stuff. But we see that just in the past years now, it got even much, much, much worse. And um, we're really far away from any kind of market consolidation. So if that's your hope to say, well, let's wait for another two years and the industry will have solved that problem uh, of interoperability, that simply won't happen. Now, as a matter of fact, we have 
to deal with that situation. How can we deal with that? Well, we could say that the devices themselves have to implement in software then all kinds of different um, protocols uh, to be able to speak to many of the rest. But this simply doesn't work out in reality because the end devices are usually very constrained devices in terms of power, CPU uh, capabilities, and so on. So from the hardware, they usually have one radio chip built in and that's how they can communicate. So it simply won't work that you do peer-to-peer -peer across multiple kinds of protocols and stuff. So the only realistic chance uh, to have an intermediate um, point that does the translation, that does the handshake between devices and make uh, all the stuff work together in some way. Now, there are approaches to provide such an intermediate uh, hub functionality uh, in the cloud. Think, for example, of services like Ift, If This Then That, which is a web service that allows you to combine other web services and automate things for you. Another example is uh, the Works with Nest uh, program, where also the manufacturers connect their cloud services together and uh, make that work together. But from a from consumer perspective, um, this is actually pretty depressing for me. So I, I like to call this slide my rainy day slide. Um, it's nothing that really makes me happy, this infrastructure, although this seems to be the way the, the industry is moving and what seems to be the best practice, how to design smart devices. But as a consumer, I don't uh, really want to depend completely on the internet for my smart home stuff. Because that really means that whenever the internet is down and also in times with always on, you know yourself that there can be situations where you don't have internet access, where something is broken there. And if you then can't control your heating, your lights, your shutters and whatever in your house, uh, that's simply a no-go. And um, what is also worse is that you depend on all the different cloud services, which means for the setup process already, you actually have to register an account with all kinds of different companies. Remember your individual credentials. I hope you all use individual credentials for all your web services. Um, hook up your devices to that. And as long as uh, you only have a few devices, that might still work. But if you're looking into the future when maybe you have 50 bulbs around your house from 10 different vendors, and you need uh, to manage your web accounts for them. You have all your chairs with present sensors built in or whatever. You, you don't want to hook them up all to some web accounts to make that work. And another thing to remember is, well, there is actually no cloud. There are only other people's computers. So you might still be happy that your devices send all their data and all your information to some fancy startup in California. Um, but um, forget about NSA and so on. Our America is our friend, after all. But I, I can tell you I recently bought a webcam because it was pretty cheap. It had a wide-angle lens, and I thought, well, pretty neat. Something shipped from China. And when I plugged it in, I noticed it didn't offer me a local video stream at all. It sent all the video stream through the great Chinese wall to some Chinese servers and allowed me with some uh, application on the smartphone with strange Chinese uh, characters on it to view my video stream. I can tell you I, I never ever plugged that camera in again, okay? That's simply a no-go, um, can't be used. Maybe it's encoding problem? Encoding problem? <laughs> <laughs> so, for smart home, for me, one important aspect is the home itself on that. And so what I actually like to talk about is the intranet of things in contrast to the internet of things. So I have my devices for the smart home. They are local. They are at home. They are built in there. And um, as they are there, I have my local network, and I want them to communicate on the local network as much as possible. And um, this not only increases the reliability, it's also really a security issue that uh, you don't have these many uh, 
cloud connections that could be all a potential vulnerability. Um, and also, yeah, as I said, the dependency on the services. You might remember the uh, discussion when Google Nest now shut down uh, Revolve as a service, uh, that all of a sudden the hardware that people bought uh, was bricked. They can't use it anymore because it depended on the cloud service from them. So um, in, in my setup, I would wish that there is really only the central hub that does a remote cloud connection to allow me remote access to my home, to allow me software updates uh, and other things, but this through a secure provider, through a trusted source to do that. Now, on this uh, picture here, you see that as a gateway, that's the product that we're building from Deutsche Telekom. And on this home gateway, uh, this is actually running Eclipse Smart Home uh, as, a, as a part of the software stack. And Eclipse Smart Home is an open source project at the Eclipse Foundation, uh, part of the our Eclipse IoT efforts there. And um, I just had the perfect talk right before me from uh, Milan, who, who talked about the, the virtues of OSGI here. And um, Eclipse Smart Home is using Java. That's why I'm here. It is using OSGI for modularity. And um, I can completely confirm what Milan uh, was saying that um, yeah, the hard part is to get a modular application, but it really pays off in the end. And OSGI is uh, a good uh, mean to actually achieve that on the Java platform today. So what does Eclipse Smart Home uh, directly offer? So it's, it's a framework to build smart home gateways. And um, it focuses on four different uh, functional blocks, more or less. First is uh, all around discovering of devices, setting them up, configuring them to get them working in a working state. Second part is uh, all about automation, so having a rule engine built in there. Third, uh, all data handling, meaning exposing information to a REST API, but also persisting data to local databases, sending it uh, potentially to a cloud database uh, for further processing. And uh, last but not least, all user interaction, be it graphical user interfaces, uh, web applications, uh, smartphone apps, or also uh, voice enabling, so text-to-speech or speech-to-text, voice recognition, and uh, these kinds of interactions that you wish at home. Having a bit uh, closer look at the architecture, um, this shows that uh, it is really very modular and extensible. So that's an important aspect here that um, Eclipse Smart Home provides the core services, the APIs, and um, people can then build their different ways of um, yeah, doing stuff. For example, on the south side of the APIs, it's a so-called binding or things API that allows to uh, reach out to the different protocols devices and uh, to integrate them. In order to support that, the Eclipse Smart Home comes with support for UPMP, MDNS for discovery uh, things, MQTT, uh, serial communication uh, to yeah, do some low-level um, transport protocol here and other things. On the application side, so everything above the our smart home core, uh, also the rule engine, uh, the persistent service and so on, this is all very modular where you can plug in your kind of uh, database provider, where you can uh, plug in your own um, rule uh, handling modules and, and uh, pieces of logic there. And at the very top, uh, all of that is exposed through a REST API, uh, which is very powerful. And uh, it's also possible to expose uh, Eclipse Smart Home functionality to other systems as well. So for example, there is an integration uh, for HomeKit. So it's possible to actually have everything that you have connected underneath. It doesn't depend. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of technology this is to expose that as a HomeKit compatible device. So you can directly use your iOS devices, use Siri uh, to talk to your home and uh, take control of the things. Same exists um, as an emulation uh, that emulates a Philips Hue bridge. 
So Philips U, the LED bulbs from Philips, um, they are supported by many things, like for example the Amazon Echo device. So with this uh, emulation on Eclipse Smart Home, you can then directly ask the Echo to discover devices and it will find all the stuff that you have connected uh, to Eclipse Smart Home there. So again, it gives you much broader access and much broader possibilities than just single vendor solutions there. So from an architecture perspective on the, on the um, yeah, interaction model, Eclipse Smart Home does a very strict separation between the, the functional view on things and the, the physical uh, part. So the, the functional view is really um, a concept we call items there. So you have functional um, items that express a certain functionality, like a light in a room or, or a temperature. And uh, all this is completely independent of any physical hardware. Uh, first of all. So the user interfaces are designed on this functional level, the automation rules are defined uh, based on that. And uh, when talking about the physical devices, this is then done through the so-called bindings uh, that you've seen. And uh, they are easily replaceable. For, so for whatever technology and device type uh, you want to add there, uh, this simply translates then between the um, defined functions and uh, the physical device so that uh, you can also at any time easily decide to actually replace something with something else. Like take the, the outside weather temperature is your function. You can first get that from some web service and then you buy a weather station one day and you just say, well, now I have a different source for that information without having to touch your UIs, your rules and so on. Just to um, yeah, get the, the uh, definitions, the terms here again. So on the bindings, we call ab uh, talk about things. And the things are the, are the discoverable units and the configurable units. So we discover a thing, we set it up. And the thing can be something very technical, like on this picture. So really just an actuator with two channels, so providing two, two functionalities here. And the items then are really the light bulbs in my kitchen and in my living room, and these are the ones I, are, I as a user, am, in, am interested in, in the end. While the thing is really just something technical that needs to be configured, that needs to be set up, but it doesn't matter so much for the application in the end anymore. Now, on the user interface side, um, it follows also a bit the, the Java paradigm, write once, run anywhere. So you're actually declaring the content that you want to have on your UI um, in a declarative way on the server side. And then different UI applications, different smartphone applications, the web UIs, they all refer to that definition and render it uh, in their way how uh, they think it's applicable for their platform. Now, as I said, Eclipse Smart Home is a framework to build, uh, op uh, to build solutions, smart home solutions. The KiwiCon platform is something we, we sell in Germany um, to customers. Uh, it's also offered as a B2B offer for international partners. It's used by KPN in the Netherlands, for example. Um, another uh, solution that exists uh, since this year is from company Jung. They build usually sockets, wall switches, and they are very uh, deep into KNX technology, so professional smart home um, devices and stuff. And they just uh, launched a product now which easily allows you to visualize a KNX setup uh, that has been done by a professional installer for you. And uh, last not, but not least, uh, the OpenHub project, which is open source, freely available for the DIY space or for developers like you, um, which is really pure software, which you download, can deploy on a Raspberry Pi or uh, some other small device and really tweak it however you like and use that. And um, for the next demos here, I'll, I'll use uh, OpenHub directly to show that. So enough of the slides. I brought you some devices here and uh, I want to briefly show you a few things how it looks in real life then. So 
I will run OpenHAP directly from uh, my MacBook here out of the IDE, but uh, it's really behaving the same way as if you would have deployed it now on some Raspberry. It's just more convenient for me for the demos to run it here. So I'm launching in the runtime. Uh, this is connected to my own private network. I brought my router here. I have connected a sonar speaker to it, a LiveX uh, color bulb, and oh, it's, intranet. it's intranet, yes. I'm completely offline, so you will see here it's my demo network, and there's really no internet access at all. Try it now. So what I can access is my local host now. This has started up. It um, welcomes me on the dashboard with the different uh, UIs and um, possibilities here. So what, what is meant for the setup process is the so-called paper UI. We go in here. We see that uh, in our inbox, uh, which is the place where it puts all the devices that it found on my network, uh, directly in, it says there's a play one, so the speaker uh, has been found here. It couldn't find the LiveX bulb yet because uh, I didn't power it on, so there's no, no good chance for it to discover it. Now that it's turned on, it shouldn't take too long uh, to also appear then in the inbox. And yeah, while we're waiting, I can already say let's approve the play one, so we accept that uh, as a device that we want to use. This is added. Come on. Usually that is faster. I can help it a little bit. So let's trigger discovery for LiveX, and then it's immediately there. So usually it just scans in the background, and the devices often just announce themselves once a minute or so, but uh, you can also directly trigger a discovery and it has found that one. So let's accept that as well as a thing. You can now look at the control panel here and we should directly be able to control it. That looks good. We can start the, the speaker. Ah. Okay, so full control of these devices here already. So I brought another device which hasn't been uh, discovered yet, uh, which is a Z-Wave a smart plug that's uh, able to also measure the energy uh, that is consumed. So I can plug that thing in. It won't be discovered because my computer doesn't know about Z-Wave yet, so I have a USB dongle that uh, speaks Z-Wave protocol. So I can plug that one in. And unfortunately, we don't have yet a discovery for USB because if you ever try to do that in Java, it's really not that simple. Um, we're working on that. But for the moment, I have to manually add that. So I have my serial port of this USB here. So we can now just say on the inbox, we say add a new device, uh, Z-Wave manually add one, a serial controller, and we need to provide the serial port of that uh, USB stick. So we plug that in. Now it starts blinking here. It starts scanning for Z-Wave devices, and so we see it already uh, found the wall plug here. So we can accept that one, give it a bit shorter name. Let's call it simply plug, add here. And on our control panel, we also have the plug. And here's, here's also a physical button on it. So if I press here, we see it on the UI. It's uh, changing there as well. Also reporting the power now. OK. Um, all these things are now also directly available on a smartphone application. So I have the very same. For example, here now the LiveX bulb on my uh, phone, and uh, just one feature I want to show you is that I can also use NFC to take control of stuff. So this is now a programming mode. I have an NFC tag. They're pretty cheap, just a, a small sticker on the Sonos here, and I'm programming that now uh, to actually say it should 
toggle uh, this light that is here on the control. So now that it's programmed, I don't even have to be in the app. I can be just on uh, somewhere. And if I'm now touching here, I can turn on and off my light. So th that's already a much neater way to use your smartphone to control the light, although it still doesn't make much sense to use a smartphone to control the light. But the, the cool feature about these NFC tags is that uh, you can actually use them also easily outdoors. So I have one at my garage, for example, to open the garage door. And uh, it's completely secure because my smartphone is hooked up securely to the Wi-Fi. It's authenticating against my open up runtime. And nobody else can make use of this NFC tag, which is there. But for me, it's really convenient also to switch uh, sockets out in the garden so that I can turn them on there. I don't need any physical button or whatever. It's uh, really a uh, nice feature for doing stuff like that. So, so far, we, we've only done remote control. Um, but the good thing about home automation is the automation. So it doesn't need us. It can do things by itself. Let's look at uh, what we can do there. We have the, the rules uh, menu entry here. And for easy uh, start for beginners who don't really know how to program complex rules themselves, we have a concept called uh, rule templates. So we can say, let's create a new rule from a template. And uh, one that I have prepared is called uh, energy meter. Let me put that a bit bigger. So the description already says, well, it visualizes the current energy consumption on a light. So what we have to do is to choose our consumption item. And there we should find down here the power of the Z-Wave plug. We choose our color item for the light to control, which is here the live X. And uh, we have to define the maximum consumption when actually the light should show red. And for this demo, I brought you another cool device, which is my hair dryer. Um, and uh, if I look at that, it says uh, maximum power 1,200 watts. So let's put that in here. We say save. And uh, there's now the rule created. And let's see if that directly works. So let's look here. The switch is on. Let's turn on the hair dryer. Wow, red. We turn it off. goes green again. We have the first. It goes to a yellowish tone. So you have a great, great energy meter here directly. And if you're going to bed at night and it shows red, then you should really wonder, did I leave something on? Do I have to look for something? So can be kind of quite, quite nice feature and really easy to automate, as you can see. So what did, uh, did this template actually do in the background? We can have a look here. And um, the rules are in Eclipse Smart Home, they are more or less um, uh, modular creation of triggers, conditions, and actions. So triggers are, are some events that make something uh, happen in the first place. And conditions, you can say, well, OK, but please don't continue now, because it's at night. I'm not at home. So this should actually not work, that use case. And the actions are then what uh, should happen. So this uh, template created a trigger that uh, reacts on any change of the uh, measured consumption here. And it changes the light color. If we look a bit closer now into this action, we see that uh, what is used here is a so-called script action where we have defined it's actually some JavaScript code that gets executed. And uh, the script is directly down here, which has been pre-filled with the placeholders of our two, uh, 1,200 watts with the item names and so on. And this script is actually executed on the Nashorn uh, JavaScript engine uh, on the runtime directly on the server. So although it was very easy here for beginners to create this rule based on the template, the power users can really use the scripting here and do whatever they want. They can tweak that now and also create that from scratch. Now, this rule, if we click here, we see that um, 
the UI communicates with the server uh, simply by sending uh, JSON structures. So all these uh, modules of the rule, the triggers, and uh, the trigger and the action are defined here as some JSON. And um, I can now directly switch here to our REST API to show that directly. So that's the Swagger uh, UI to make the REST easily accessible. We can go to the rules endpoint, get all rules, and we see this is exactly the JSON structure which are, is now available on the runtime as a rule. And uh, you can now, if you want to build your own fancy user interfaces on top of that, rule editors, whatever, you can simply take that structure, do a HTTP post uh, with your modifications, uh, send it back, and it will be immediately active. So besides the rules, of course, all uh, the other functionality is available here, so your inbox items and so on. So it's really um, completely decoupled the user interfaces from that so that um, it's very easy to build other stuff on top. You haven't seen the items yet here because I'm currently in a, in a simple mode where the items are more or less created for all the functions that the things that were discovered uh, provide. But uh, we see on the REST API that the items exist there, so there are our current artists from the Sonos and so on. But uh, I can also now activate that in the uh, UI. And for that, I just go oh, on the services, go on the system, and say, well, we leave the simple mode, go to the advanced mode now. And uh, we now see an items tab appearing here. So this is now really my functional view on the system the different functionalities, and um, for a next uh, demo case, I just want to manually add a function here, which I say it's my doorbell. I give that a name as a category for a nice icon, a switch. The type of that is a switch, so it's a Boolean value, more or less, and I can save that. So I've now defined a new item, a new functionality, doorbell, and um, I actually brought here my doorbell with me, uh, that's uh, the flick uh, push button. It's actually a Bluetooth uh, device powered by a coin cell. And uh, this is now already programmed that it sends an HTTP request to the REST API for the item doorbell to say, well, okay, on, yes. So that's my, my new fancy doorbell. And, uh, of course, if I'm pressing here, not much is happening. We can maybe see that... No, it's not even... Not even appearing in the log file yet. Uh, okay. I hope that will work. Um, so that is here. What we now also have to do is to play somehow the doorbell itself. Uh, well, luckily, we have the speaker for that. We have to now um, go to no, the speaker, I said, not the light. The Sonos, and uh, here we can see actually now technically the channels that it provides, so the functionality uh, that we've seen on the UI as well, but we can now show some more stuff because it has a lot of features. And um, one thing I want to add here is the notification sound. Uh, so I can enable that, create a new item for that, and I just call that my speaker that it... Um, can send uh, notifications to that. I can also enable, oops, I can enable the uh, notification sound volume. Um, uh, notification volume, that's good. So both of them are added. And uh, what I can do now is to manually create a rule from here, saying it's my doorbell rule. As a trigger, I want to have an item state change to react on that. I'm selecting my newly created doorbell item here. And as an action, I want to play the sound on my output device, which is the speaker here. So it's the channel that allows me to output something. 
Sorry? Um, right here, it can be only one, but I can, of course, add another action, if you like that. So you can now select a different one. So it's not always just one trigger, one action, one condition, but you can have any number and really do complex rules here. OK, let's save that. And it rings. So, and the, the nice thing is, so we have, this is the notification volume. Let's put that up a bit. So even if you're playing music now, okay. And this is now the volume of the music. We can have that pretty low. This is the volume of the notification sound. And if now somebody rings my doorbell, It plays that in different uh, volume, and it goes back to my uh, music then in the end. So the music is still playing here. And the cool thing is now, OK, you can ring here as often as you uh, want. But uh, you have an easy functionality to also disable the rule. And so now your doorbell is also disabled. So you can say, well, that actually only happens when you're at home or uh, whatever, and don't do not do it at night or have it at, at a different volume at night and so on. So fully automated smart doorbell. Okay. So with that, let me uh, quickly switch back to the slides. As the table is pretty small here, I, I was only able to bring you a few devices. But uh, on OpenHub, there are actually many, many bindings. So these are some logos uh, of some bindings or integrations that exist there. Um, I stopped uh, preparing the logos after 50 bindings. We're now at more than 120 different uh, bindings. And including the other uh, add-ons for persistence uh, and uh, so, uh, such things, we're now reaching uh, 200 extensions. So all of that, um, again, is OSGI bundles, OSGI packaging. And the OSGI really helps here on the modularity of the software so that people can really now say, well, they have this device. They want support for that um, protocol. So they simply pick and choose what they need, put that together, and it's working. And uh, that's also directly possible during runtime. You don't even have to restart your system. You just say, I want to have Z-Wave support now. It downloads that from a uh, Maven repository, installs it, and it's directly available for you. Now, people also ask me, well, this here is maybe a nice demo, but, but what is really uh, useful for you at home or uh, in real life? And I just want to give you some maybe not so obvious uh, use cases, and um, all of them from my garden, actually. So one use case I implemented is uh, a special wish from my wife, who usually had the problem that in summertime she puts the washing uh, out in the garden for drying. And when then a sudden rain shower comes, uh, she was always too late to get it in, and it was all wet again. So now, when the first raindrops come down, we have a text-to-speech notification in the house through every room. Hey, it starts raining. So she can run, get the washing in dry, and everything's fine. <laughs> That's perfect. She loves it. <laughs> oh. It's all about providing value to the customers, right? So she's my customer. She asked for that. What to do? So... Um, what is more convenient for me is, uh, again, the doorbell. Because um, for the use case in the garden, you might uh, know this problem if you have a garden or a balcony yourself. If you're outside, you hardly hear the doorbell inside. So you might miss your guests, although you're at home. So I have a speaker out on the terrace, which is automatically activated if my terrace door is open. And the speaker simply plays exactly this MP3 file that you've heard. So that's my original doorbell at home. And uh, so even when I'm out in the garden, I'm, I'm not missing that, and uh, I can clearly hear it. And of course, um, if I'm not even at home, uh, there is no uh, sound played, but I directly get a push notification on the smartphone, on the doorbell. Third use case uh, is for my uh, irrigation um, system uh, in the garden for the plants. 
I have a water cistern, and um, the problem is that if that is empty and the pump runs dry, that breaks. I already had to replace it once, and it was very costly. So I put a level sensor into the cistern to uh, know how much water there is. And if it goes below 2%, uh, I shut off the pump so that it uh, won't break anymore. And just this winter, um, it provided me some further information, which is exactly this chart here. So that was during winter time when I didn't use the water pump. I didn't uh, use anything. So I l had to learn that actually my cistern is leaking because it's going always down to 30% and that's it uh, without taking any water out. So I knew that I had to call now on the service to have it repaired even before the first hot summer days come in. Now, I hope you say, well, that's uh, all cool. Let's, let's start with that. Let's uh, try it out as well. So how do you start? Well, for OpenHub uh, 2, there is a getting started on docs.openhub.org. Um, and it's really just a zip file that you download, or unpack, or start with the start script, and that's it. So you can easily try and reproduce uh, what I did here. Then. If you have uh, some fancy device that you're building yourself or something that uh, is not yet supported, uh, it's easy to actually implement such a binding yourself. And as we still have a few minutes left, I'd just like to quickly show you how that looks like. So on my console here, I'm uh, at the GitHub uh, repository of the OpenUp2 bindings. And I just switch in add-ons and bindings here. We see a long list of uh, different bindings in here and a script called create a binding skeleton. If we call that script, is that large enough? Be okay. It asks me to provide a parameter binding in camel case. Okay. So let's call it my cool stuff. And now this is uh, calling a Maven archetype that creates me really the, the skeleton for the project. It asks me for an author name. That's me. OK. Creating that. And if we're now looking in our folder, uh, we see it has created a new folder here, org open hub binding my cool stuff, which we can now directly take and import into our workspace. So, okay, this is all and only this. So we're importing the project. And here it is. So what it uh, generated is really an OSGI bundle with everything that is uh, required in here. And it also generated an ESH, let me increase the size here, an ESH standing for Eclipse Smart Home, our information folder with some meter, meter information about my binding, which is here. So a name, a description, the author has been filled in here. And it created a sample uh, thing definition. So this is also just an XML structure where you can more or less declare what, what is the device that you want to provide through your binding or the devices. You can have uh, any number in here. And um, we have now here the sample device with one channel defined. And the channel is of this type where we have to define what item it can be linked to. So we say now this is a switch, just a Boolean. We can provide a label for that and say, well, this switch does something. We save that. And then what it also generated is the My cool Stuff handler. This is the most important class um, through which you can now implement what should be done. So there are more, more or less two methods. One, initialize, which is called a system startup. You might want to reach out to your device to see whether it's online or offline, if it's accessible at that moment. And as a default implementation, well, it sets it simply to online. Let's, let's be confident. 
The other method is uh, handle command, which is called by the framework uh, whenever yeah, you are supposed to do something. So we can now set a breakpoint into this method. Launch our runtime again. My cool stuff uh, as a bundle we have to add here so that it's active. The handler uh, didn't change anything to it. So give it a moment to start. We're going back now to our UI. We should see on the, there we go, almost ready. On the bindings tab, we now have, besides LiveX, Z-Wave, Sonos, we also have my cool stuff binding here with information what things are supported by that. And uh, we can now also easily add one here. So we didn't implement any discovery of that, so we are adding a thing manually. We give it a name, my stuff. Save that, and in here we see it has the one channel, and this is directly enabled, so on the control panel, we see now also my stuff appeared here with one functionality that does something, and if we are now clicking on that button, we're directly ending up in the IDE in our breakpoint, and we see that for the channel ID, Channel 1, which is the one that we defined, we received a command which is on. And now at that place it's up to you to implement whatever needs to be done to access your device and to switch something. But it's really very straightforward, very easy to build such an uh, extension yourself here. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. So we have five minutes left for questions. Over there. Uh, okay. Uh, assume we have uh, bindings for something existing and we want to implement something custom about that device that has already bindings about it. Can you do that? Can you, uh, can you extend existing binding that you don't have access to with some additional actions or? Um, the question is, what's the situation that you don't have access to the bindings? Because all of this is open source, so it is available. You can directly tweak the code. But uh, OSGI also allows you to um, actually put fragments on top of bundles, which is uh, meant to be an additional functionality on existing bundles that you don't have to touch the original bundles. So yes, it is possible to actually uh, provide, for example, new uh, thing descriptions and alternative thing handler implementation through a fragment uh, and to hook that up there. For example, make that light bulb blink in a specific way. I guess you don't have the exactly the action blink in <coughs> first one time short and then one time long. Yeah, but um, this is actually something where you should consider is that really a functionality of the light bulb? Does it, does it offer by default already some kind of blinking action? For example, uh, Philips U does that and the Philips U binding also directly supports that as a switch. So you can actually say let's blink and it starts blinking by the hardware itself. Or is that rather now our, our logic that is purely implemented in software? And then such a blink functionality is actually something that makes sense for not only this bulb, but for any bulb in general. And then you might rather want to consider to uh, define that as a rule action. So you can define your own action type for rules, say blink, and uh, so the users can then define their rules, say blink, and they choose the device that should blink. Thank you. Any other questions? 
hear? I can hear you, but um, yeah, that's the microphone. Thank you. Uh, could you please give us some more details about the device that you're developing? The QVCon, I think. Um, QVCon builds uh, the gateway itself. So the only hardware that Deutsche Telekom is building is really the home gateway that has uh, support for different radio technologies to reach out to the devices. But the end devices like, uh, I don't know, switches, thermostats, uh, whatever, they are all from uh, partners. So that's nothing we build ourselves. But uh, we really built the integration platform that makes it possible to connect all the stuff into one solution for the customer. Do you have any information where, when this device will be available or? It is available since, it is? let me think, one and a half years or even two years already. So yes, uh, but we sell it on the German market. But there it's uh, available throughout all the sales channels of Deutsche Telekom, so the tea shops are, you can very easily get it everywhere there. So my question is pretty much general. So um, there is a big potential for these technologies, but the market itself somehow didn't, didn't see this potential. Uh, I mean, we don't have specialists who are able to install these things, so at least only enthusiasts that are you know, coding and debugging bulbs. Um, but um, how is there in Germany, for example, you sell a device, but you, do you provide the services for installation? And do you have, uh, you know, somehow kind of support for this? And how, when the device is supported by this technology, will be cheaper and affordable? Let us say it like this. So oh, two questions. That, that, that's a very general question, I guess. And nothing I, I have uh, influence on, on uh, pricing strategies of for any hardware vendors out there in the world. Um, but well, from a Deutsche Telekom perspective, we focus on devices that uh, people can easily install themselves. So it's all really radio-based. We are not doing any cable uh, wiring or installation where you need professional installers. Um, so everything can be retrofitted by the uh, consumers themselves. And um, we built an application for KiwiCon on top of that, uh, which is more or less an interactive user manual how to set up the stuff. So the devices are often complex uh, because you have to press three times and then wait five seconds and press another time in order to have them paired and hooked up. And uh, so we have very interactive and very good tutorials uh, directly in the uh, setup wizard there to make it as easy as possible. Um, but uh, besides that, I'm not completely sure on the question whether we also offer directly from Deutsche Telekom the services to go to the people to help our installation. But uh, there are, of course, call centers that help in case of problems and so on. So it's a complete product, let us say it like this, with support and so on, yes? Sorry? So it's a complete product, yes, with everything, so yes. from hardware to service. Okay. Yeah. So in regard to the OSGR runtime, so you're currently deploying uh, OpenHAP and Smart Home with Equinox, right? Um, OpenHAP is uh, using Equinox at the moment, that's correct. And have you experimented with um, other OSGI containers such as Concierge and have you tried to see whether they're more fit? Um. I know that somebody used it on Apache Felix, uh, which also worked. And we just this year with OpenHub switched to the Compendium services uh, of Apache. So the configuration admin service, uh, declarative services, and so on. This is now used from Apache instead of Equinox. Um, so in general, the, the Eclipse Smart Home framework itself is really designed in a way that it runs on any OSGI framework. So for Deutsche Telekom, we're using a commercial framework uh, that uh, works underneath. So it's really rather independent of the framework. Another interesting one there to mention is the Eclipse Concierge implementation. That's an OSGI 5 compatible framework, uh, very small, lightweight, I think just 500 kilobytes or somewhere around that. 
Um, there were still some issues that OpenHub wasn't running on that because of uh, other libraries that were used that weren't completely compatible, but uh, that's something we're, we're heading for as well. Thank you. Okay, I think the time's up. I'll be around here if there are further questions. So thanks again.